Hey YouTube, I'm uh, making a video because my buddy Landon said that uh, he should, that I should be making videos, so here we go. <laughs> anyway, here are my thoughts. Um, I uh, recently uh, posted a, an interesting uh, thing uh, to, one, to one of my teams. I, I don't know, some of you know I'm a, a software engineer, so I work as a uh, programmer building education software. And... Um, and there's this concept of agile programming, uh, which is uh, this idea that <clears throat> that there's um, kind of this like sprints, for instance, uh, which is a, a two week um, iteration on software development where you kind of chunk out different pieces of the software you're developing and you say, OK, I'm only going to uh, commit to uh, this um, piece of code and you do the whole sprint thing to try to avoid continuously having to change the requirements on the software that you uh, are going to write. Now, um, so as any good programmer does, I guess, um, I found some inefficiencies with how we at Instructure were uh, creating um, or doing our sprints. So I actually posted a... Um, kind of a front-end manifesto, which might seem kind of weird, but I thought it might be nice to have something down on paper. So uh, I, I posted this manifesto, and um, and I've been getting some pretty decent feedback, but I've been learning about uh, kind of getting people on board. So I wanted to um, do a little post, kind of read what it's about, because it's, um, it's, it's not exactly Agile. So Agile is kind of a very more broad than you'd actually think. Um, and there's the Agile Manifesto, um, which is great. Uh, but what we really wanted to do is move towards continuous deployment. And continuous deployment um, can be kind of hard, especially when you're dealing with enterprise software. Um, because, you know, you're dealing with people that have like a lot of strict requirements and usually enterprise software is feature driven, whereas consumer facing software is going to be uh, like uh, uh, user driven. So, which kind of sucks, right? So, uh, but it's just the nature of the beast. It's B2B versus, you know, B2C kind of thing. Um, anyway, I'm gonna go through this document real quick for you. Um, and uh, I'm actually interested in some feedback. Um, from anyone that's trying to implement continuous deployment type development. Now, for any of you that aren't aware of what continuous deployment is, it's uh, the idea that rather than um, having uh, these large uh, releases every two, three weeks, maybe a month or quarterly, depending on how your company does it or you do, rather than deploying uh, to production like that, you continuously end up deploying to production. Um, and you ask yourself, okay, that sounds cool, but like that sounds like it's gonna break a lot of stuff. So there's a few things you can do to make it better. Now, in my manifesto, um, I list out seven things that I've seen uh, that work really, really well. And a lot of this is relying on um, some tools that a lot of times we might overlook. For instance, uh, get, uh, or mainly in get actually, get bisect, um, which is a fantastic tool for debugging and helping your deployment process go very quickly. So, uh, here, so, so here's the document. The first thing is, uh, and, and oh, I'll link this in the show notes. Okay, so first thing, uh, forward facing commits and migrations. This means uh, commits and migrations should never break a database. If you change or move something, it requires a new migration. Features that depend on data migrations should either include two commits, one for the migration and the other for the feature, or include the migration first. Um, you know, so so here basically what I'm saying is um, you should never have to roll back um, in order to fix something, as well as um, you know there there can never be a s situation where uh, where you have to build everything all at once or it'll break. And this is, my, this is actually kind of obvious, but the reason why I'm mentioning this is because um, a lot of the times with these bigger type softwares, running a build or getting it through your like test environments and stuff is a big process. And so you clump a lot of stuff into a bigger commit um, in order to avoid that pain. But here, um, if 
if you have smaller commits um, that uh, that never break the build, this kind of thing, um, you'll be. Um, it's not that bad to add two or three commits um, that make sure things are always kind of forward facing. I, I hope that makes sense. The point I'm trying to say is uh, you're always just make sure that you have uh, commits that don't rely on other commits that are going to be there kind of a thing. Okay, so moving on. Number two, rolling feature flag releases, no feature branches. And this is something I really like. So large features can be released um, iteratively or, uh, yeah, iteratively um, should be uh, behind feature flags. Um, and then the feature flag should be enabled for your users. So this is kind of one of the one of the key points. And if you want to get to continuous deployment, you want to uh, make sure that you have your feature flags um, in place so that um, customers uh, don't actually see the development, um, right? So you don't want to like show them the product until it's uh, ready to be seen. Um, but this enables you to push to master right away as long as it doesn't break the build and isn't destroying things. Um, and you have, you know, appropriate integration tests and uh, unit tests. So this is all key. Um, you're actually going to be fine, even if you uh, post something that's like definitely not ready for a user to see. Um, but you need the feature flag. Next, uh, in a three, small non-breaking commits. This is really important. So now I'm mainly working in the front end, so this is uh, JavaScript, but this can definitely be applied using maybe like Sandy Metz rules, fantastic rules. I'm applying a, a rule of 300 lines or less. Uh, Sandy does uh, 100 lines, but I think JavaScript is a little more verbose. So, um, so 300 lines um, in a commit. So if your commit is over 300 lines long, um, make a new one. And you might go, well, that's dumb. Why would I do that? Well, actually, it's, it's it makes it really easy for someone, one, to code review. Two, um, if you are using tools like Get Bisect, it really makes it easy to be like, oh, okay, uh, this particular refactor or this particular code change um, broke right the build or broke the feature or, or whatever when you have these super large commits you can't really break down these bugs and problems in a really consumable way so uh, having very small non-breaking commits is super important um, iteration over increment um, increment uh, <laughs> incre sorry iteration over incremental development um, is number four so uh, in most cases uh, we're seeing a uh, uh, incremental development. There's a there's an interesting um, uh, visualization that uh, you can look at um, how uh, a Mona Lisa painting might be done if it was incremental versus uh, iteration, right? Um, and I'll post that in the show notes as well. Um, but essentially, this is large brush brush strokes through the whole feature versus doing like this piece, this piece, this piece. Um, software in general is better developed, in my <laughs> humble opinion, that way. Um, and uh, it allows you to stay a little bit more dynamic, understand the, the full problem and that kind of thing. Uh, number five is very related to number three, which is small file size. Uh, files should be no larger than 300 lines long. So both commit and file size should never be larger than 300 lines long. Um, if it is, it means that it's time to break it up into another, uh, more modules and those kind of things. Um, now this one is something I really like. Uh, it's tagging as a first class citizen. So sometimes we forget um, in Git we have this wonderful thing called annotated tags. So in Git you have two kinds of tags. You have annotated and then just the regular uh, non-annotated tags. Um, and uh, with an annotated tag you can put the version number on the tag as well as a complete note. So uh, why is that so cool? Well, you can do your commits, explain what your commit does in your commit message, and maybe a longer description if you need it. But once the feature is ready to be thrown into the QA pipeline, um, then you tag that commit as saying test right here, and then you get you give your test plan for your QA guys. Um, this is nice because if you want to do continuous deployment and post out lots and lots of commits a day, 15 a day, you know, or more, um, 
God, you, you're going to kill your QA people and they're going to hate you because they're never going to be able to keep up with you. Um, but uh, they don't actually need to QA everything. Um, if you do your development this way, you only need to commit, or sorry, uh, QA the commits that complete a feature. And then after that's QA'd, rather than um, uh, it, it gets pushed and then there's one more um, uh, which is turning the feature flag on. Or actually now thinking about it, it would be better to do a, a commit which is turning the feature flag on in which QA then will QA turning the future flag on to make sure, um, you know, it's good for your <laughs> customers. Now these feature flags um, I'm talking about are really internal feature flags. You can make it, depending on your product, you could make these um, you know, things that admins can turn on and off. But this is also nice because you can do something like that, right? So if you want to provide a lot of customization, depending on the product you're doing um, to your for, uh, for your customers, this is something that could provide that right out of the box. You don't have to do anything other than, you know, maybe make a little UI for it. But okay. And the last one is merge quick and code review is part of the workflow. So I don't know if anybody's seen uh, this in their development cycle, but kind of code reviews become this like grudging uh, process where you're like, oh, okay, I'll do it in the mornings or I'll do it in the evenings uh, or this kind of thing. And they're a little bit painful because you might get a code review for something that takes you 30 minutes to do because you're out of context and it's huge. A thousand lines of code or 2000 or something ridiculous changed. And it's it's going to be really hard for you to catch any bugs and give good feedback if you're dealing with code uh, sizes that big. So um, what uh, what I'm saying here is uh, when you uh, when you push code and you merge it while that's going through the build process, um, if the commits that your colleagues are um, producing are very small, then it's going to be real easy for you to just to pop in there and do a uh, do a code review. And it should only take two minutes. It's gonna be a very high quality code review. And it'll be really, really, really easy to catch if they didn't write a test for the code. Cause <laughs> you know, um, it, it might only be 10 lines of real code and then there should be a test for it. Um, rather than this idea that uh, you'll um, catch every, you know, you should know that, you know, a thousand line commit code needs all of these tests. Like there's no way, no, no. Yeah. I mean, you have to be a superhuman to be able to code review that effectively. So, uh, merge quick code reviews are workflow. Anyway, uh, I've been chatting up a little bit, uh, too long here, but, uh, let me know what you think and I'll, um, post a, uh, I don't know if I'll post a link yet or not. Um, Maybe I'll post a link. Um, this really wasn't supposed to be necessarily too public just because uh, I haven't really refined it quite yet. But if you have uh, feedback, please uh, let me know. And um, yeah, I guess I'll post a Google Doc. Why not? Sure. Okay. Thanks, guys.